The smooth jazz buzzed through his ears as Howard finished correlating the numbers for his latest job. The Baxter account was coming along nicely. Howard felt quite sure that he would have the account books done before quitting time. It had been a hard job. Mr. Baxter had not kept good records, but he had finally chased down all those loose ends and... Howard... Howard cocked his head like a dog that's heard a sound he can't quite place. Had someone been calling him? The smooth jazz he always listened to when he worked was devoid of words. Words tended to distract him while he was working. He shook his head and got back to it. The account was nearly done, and he had a meeting in an hour to finalize it. He'd give his boss something to crow about this time. Charles Baxter was a very wealthy man, and his business would do wonders for the company. Howard bet his boss would give him a bonus after seeing all the excellent work he'd... Howard! Howard turned to look behind him. Someone had said his name, almost spoken it in his ear. As he looked around, he was perplexed as to where it was coming from. Looking back to the computer, he began to type again. His nerves were a little rattled at the thought of a disembodied voice and... Howard! Howard jumped and nearly overturned his chair. Someone had shouted his name, screamed it right into his ear. Even now, as he looked around his home office, he could see no one. Howard lived alone with no wife or children or roommates to distract him, and the thought of someone in his house made him very upset. This was his home, his place of refuge, and as he started to rise from his chair, he resigned himself to search the whole house until whoever was here was found. He had just opened the closet when the voice spoke again. Sorry to startle you, Howard. Now that I've got your attention, I need to talk to you. Howard stared dumbly into the closet. The old jackets and blue storage bins did not begin to speak to him. No one sprang from concealment either to admit to the disturbance, and he came to realize that the voice was not coming from the house. The voice was not an intruder or a disembodied ghost voice, of which he did not believe in. The voice seemed to be coming from his earbuds. The voice was that of an average, everyday person. Howard could have sat next to him on the bus or chatted with him in line for his morning bagel. The voice was smooth, educated and not too terribly unlike his own. This made Howard feel a little easier, a little calmer. As he stood looking into the coat closet, he felt less worried about home invaders and more concerned about why someone in his earbuds knew his name. Wonderful, now that I have your attention, I need you to leave the house. That struck Howard as odd. Not that anything in this situation was expected, but leaving the house? Howard worked mostly from home, always had after his employer had determined that it was better for his productivity. As such, he had maintained a rigorous schedule. He really only left the house to get groceries once a week and to visit a certain woman he liked. Their relationship was based on cash exchange only, of course, but he still had a schedule and he liked to stick to it. You are in great danger, Howard. Men are coming to hurt you. Men who don't want you to finish this account. And if you're still here when they arrive, I fear you won't live to see tomorrow. This filled Howard with unease. Who was coming to hurt him? Why did they care so much about the Baxter account? I know this must be very upsetting to you, Howard, but I need you to do exactly as I say so we can get you out of this troublesome situation. Take all the relevant information you have on the account and put it into your briefcase. Take the hard drive out of your computer, the silver box on the second tray, and put it in there as well. You can just yank it right out. It should come free. I need you to do all of this in the next five minutes and be at the bus stop before two o'clock. Go on, get started now. Howard felt himself hesitating. Who was this voice? Why was he talking to him? How did he know that this wasn't some trick to get him to screw up all the data on his computer? Still, years of being an accountant drone meant that he had already begun to scoop the papers into his briefcase, even as he thought things over. He was used to following orders, and really, this was just one more in a long line of orders. The side of his desktop came off easily. He had saved his documents, of course, and powered it off. Now he had the case open, though, and the nagging voice asked again if he thought he was doing the right thing. This was crazy. He was going to yank a piece out of his computer just because a voice in his earbuds told him to. How did he know he wasn't being fooled? How did he know he wasn't having a mental breakdown? For all he knew, he had created the voice, which hadn't spoken in about a minute, and now he was getting ready to break his computer. Quickly now, Howard, they're on their way, the voice said, not showing the slightest bit of interest one way or another. Howard reached in, feeling the heat from the components, and gripped the hard drive. 
He lifted it out of the cradle, but instead of yanking, he detached the cables and easily brought the box out. He looked at it as it ticked and cooled and put it in his briefcase. He closed the case, grabbed his hat from beside the door, and left his house. Don't bother locking up. You probably won't be back, said the voice in that who cares sort of way. Now, walk down to the bus stop and sit with the wall blocking your view of the house. Why wouldn't I come back to my house, Howard thought, but he moved to the bus station without really thinking. He was running on autopilot as he came to the bus station and just sat down. The longer he sat, the longer the voice remained silent, the more he doubted that it would come again. A woman with a bratty kid sat next to him, and he clutched his briefcase on his lap. The kid looked up from his gadget, a box that was spewing noise at an ear-splitting level, to tell his mom that he wanted McDonald's when they got wherever they were going. She just patted him and said she would. The kid turned his grubby face back to the gadget then, and gave no more thought to the conscious world whatsoever. That was when Howard saw the car. The black town car drove right past the bus station and into his driveway. Four men in black suits climbed out and walked towards his door. One of them knocked, three loud clumps, and they all waited for 30 seconds in a state of impatient tension. They all had sunglasses on and shiny black shoes. Howard thought they looked like government agents in a spy movie. As he peeked around the bus station wall, he saw one of them drive that shoe right into the door after receiving no answer. As they filed in, he thought he saw them reach into their coats for something. But the voice came back just as a big silver bus pulled up in front of the stop. Never mind that, Howard. It's not your concern anymore. Just get on and take the bus to the number 12 stop. You can do that, can't you? As Howard flashed his bus pass and took his seat, he found that he could. He rode the bus for the better part of an hour. He kept a firm hand on his briefcase, and as he rode, his eyes kept sweeping around to look at the other riders. The bratty boy and his doting mother were a few seats away. The kid hadn't looked up from his gadget since he'd spoken to his mother, and she seemed to be busy watching the world go by. An older woman was sitting up near the front with the driver. Her clothes made him think that she might be homeless, and a young man with headphones on was sleeping near the back of the bus. The flashing sign near the front said that they were nearing stop number four. If the stops were in some kind of order, it would be eight more stops before it was his turn to get off. He glanced out the window as they drove, the bus stopping occasionally, but rarely picking anyone up. The voice in his earbuds hadn't spoken for a while. He was again beginning to wonder if he'd made the whole thing up. Here he was, on a bus, with his work and his hard drive in a briefcase like some kind of spy. Maybe he had been working too hard. Maybe his boss was right, and he really did need to take some time off. I don't want to alarm you, Howard, but it seems that the men in the town car are following you. Howard bristled. He turned his head slightly and could see the black town car in traffic behind the bus. The windows were polarized, so they couldn't see in, but they certainly knew where he was. It would be easy to find out if he had come onto this bus. He didn't exactly blend in. And then, what would they do? Would they gun him down on the bus in front of all these people? Would they arrest him? Why were they after him? I need you to get off at the next stop, Howard. Don't hesitate. Don't look around. Just step off the bus and take the alley to your left. Howard pulled the handle over his head, and when the bus stopped, he calmly walked out onto the busy sidewalk. The doors closed, and the bus rolled on into traffic. Behind it, the town car followed, being none the wiser that Howard had gotten off. He scanned the crowd and found the alley to his left. He took it, clutching the briefcase as he walked along the garbage cans. He didn't see anyone lingering around, and as he came out onto the other side of the busy street, he began to relax a little. There were no black town cars waiting for him and that gave him some small amount of reassurance. Now, cross the street and take the next alley to the number 12 stop. There will be a taxi waiting for you there. Take it to your destination. Howard glanced around, unsure until he finally saw the alley. It sat between an Italian restaurant and a computer repair store. Howard could see the large green dumpster that took up most of the lane and knew it would be a squeeze to get around it. He started across the busy street and was met by the sounds of horns honking and people cursing. He hurried across like a frightened rabbit and made the alley before the screeching tires had stopped. The alley was awash with graffiti and the old smells of pasta. Someone had hung some band poster on the wall, but it did little to add to the place's charm. The dumpster was a stinking edifice of green and chrome. Howard was no dainty flower, but he shimmied around it with very little problem. He winced when his stomach rubbed against the filthy dumpster, but he was clear a moment later and nearly out of the alley. Stop! the voice said, and suddenly Howard was against the wall. He made himself as small as he could, 
and saw the black town car pull up next to the bus stop. Don't move, just be still and they won't see you, said the oily voice in his ear. The man who had kicked in his door stepped out of the car. He bulged in his suit, a mountain of muscles, and Howard had little trouble believing that that man so easily booted in his door. He stepped out and walked to the bus stop. The bus Howard had departed pulling up and offloading the few passengers. He looked hard at the mother and the brat, the child sticking his tongue out at him, and at the old lady who shuffled up the street. The bull stepped onto the bus and looked around, exchanging words with the driver before climbing off. He and the man in a taxi had another conversation, his town car blocking the sidewalk, which ended with the taxi honking and cursing and speeding away. The town car left a few seconds later, and Howard breathed a sigh of relief. A new taxi pulled up a minute later, and the driver asked Howard if his name was Howard Kernst. Howard climbed in, and they pulled into traffic. They drove until they hit the city limits. Howard had expected to go uptown to one of the glass edifices that marked the government buildings or the high-scale holdings. He had expected to be greeted by a man in a suit who would tell him that he had done well and explain all this. Instead, they drove into the desert. The driver didn't speak, he just drove. Howard was becoming nervous. The men in the town car had been one thing, but what if the man in the earpiece was worse? He tested the door and found that it was locked. He checked the windows and found that they wouldn't open. He tapped on the glass, but the man behind the wheel ignored him. Patience, Howard, the man soothed. All your questions will be answered soon. Howard settled a little, but as they drove deeper into the desert, he began to wonder what was happening. Howard was just an accountant, a great accountant, but still an accountant. Things like this didn't happen when you were just an accountant. You might get a paper cut or stub your toe on an average day, but certainly not get yourself involved in clandestine conspiracies or life or death struggles. Hell, the files he had from the Baxter account weren't even that interesting. Baxter owed a lot of money to the government, had a lot of back taxes, but Howard had managed to clear that up. His orders had been to make the problem go away, and he had. When the car stopped, Howard was jerked out of his contemplation. They had stopped outside a rundown gas station in the middle of nowhere. Howard must have been wool gathering for longer than he thought because the sun was dipping low in the sky behind said station and the afternoon was beginning to sink into evening. A sensible black sedan was parked in front of the gas station, and as they approached, a man opened the door for Howard and ushered him out. The man was wearing a black suit, much like Howard's pursuers, and his sunglasses reflected Howard's scared face back at him as he climbed from the taxi. The taxi driver accepted an envelope from the man, neither speaking a word, and the cab pulled away, leaving Howard and the man standing in front of this rundown gas station. Right this way, Mr. Kernst, said the man, and the two walked towards the station. It was a tatty thing, gas pumps gone all brown and flaky, the glass crashed out in the windows, a single spindle rack spinning sluggishly in the wind with a single bloated magazine on it. Howard had seen a thousand of them in his time, utterly forgettable, and he feared to die in a place like this and become as forgotten as the old station. The thought was sudden, but he couldn't get it loose as soon as he had thought it. He was like a dog who's finally caught his tail and now can't let it go again. Howard was suddenly sure that this would be the place he died. The two walked around the back of the station and there was a man in a folding chair, a beach umbrella covering him from the sun. He was dressed in a white suit, little blue piping roaming up the jacket. He had a fat, jolly face, hair the color of snow, and a pair of sunglasses with some reflective lenses Howard had become used to seeing. He smiled when he saw Howard, and the smile was genuine and warm. He pulled an earpiece out as they approached, and spread his pudgy arms wide as though to hug him. At last, Mr. Kirst, at last you've arrived. May I call you Howard? It seems silly to rest on formalities after we've been through so much. Howard didn't trust him from the instant he opened his mouth until the end of his life. The man had a showy way of speaking, like a carnival barker or a snake oil salesman. He was the kind of man who turned everything into a Shakespearean presentation. He thought himself a showman, but really, he was just dramatic for the sake of drama. Howard hated people like that. The man seemed to pick up on some of his distaste. I imagine you have a dozen questions, maybe two dozen, and I want to answer them all, but I fear we don't have time. The biggest question I assume you have is why these men are chasing you, yes? Howard nodded a little sullenly. Well, the answer is quite simple. The men are, of course, my own. Yours? Howard asked, perplexed. Of course. 
You see, if you had something I wanted, and there was no sense of urgency, you might start to ask questions. You might question the voice that suddenly popped into your head. You might not have come all this way into the desert on my order if I hadn't made the stakes a little high for you. He pulled a cigarette out of a silver case he had in his jacket, and Howard flinched when he saw the case come free. For half a second, he had seen a small silver handgun come out of that jacket, and he knew his life was about to end. The man flipped the case closed, but offered it to Howard before he put it away. Howard declined, and the man slid it back into his pocket with the same disappointment. The man who had escorted him from the taxi stepped close, flicking an expensive lighter and holding it to the end of the cigarette. Howard considered running into the desert while he was occupied. Catching a bullet in the back, however, did not seem much better than dying right here. Now then, I imagine you'd like to know why I went to all this trouble to get the papers you have in your briefcase. Well, that's a little more complicated. You see, Charles Baxter has made some very important people very angry. He's made enemies out of the kind of men who don't really get mad. They get even. And in 22 hours, he will cease to exist forever. He will be erased from life, erased from memory, and erased from time. Howard gaped. Who was this guy? How exactly did you go about erasing someone from time? Charles Baxter was a fat cat around here, probably one of the most prominent businessmen in three states, but surely he was small potatoes in the grand scheme of things, right? So, as you can see, it's very inopportune for you to have files that prove this man existed at all. Charles Baxter is already dead. His associates are, as we speak, being ferreted out. You, Howard, are the last loose end we need to tie up. But, but why kill me just for having this information? The man shrugged noncommittally. Because it's easier than having you reprogrammed. At the end of the day, you're an unmarried accountant whose absence will go unremarked. You have no family, no real friends, not even any pets to mark their bowl's emptiness. You've lived an unremarkable life, Howard. Your death will be much the same. He threw the cigarette into the sand, half smoked, and held his hands out towards Howard. Now then. The case, please. It was said nice enough, but Howard knew that it wasn't a request. The man was used to giving orders and having them followed, and for a moment, Howard thought about refusing him. He would die here, he knew that, but maybe he could die with some dignity. Perhaps he could die having fought against something that didn't seem right. He held onto the case for a few seconds, not sure what he meant to do with it, but in the end, he found himself handing the case to the man under the umbrella. At the end of the day, he was just an accountant, after all. The man accepted the case, smiling, and this time, the hand that came out of the suit coat did contain a small silver handgun. Thank you, Howard. You've been very helpful. The gun went off, and Harold felt the slug enter his body. It burned for a few seconds, then he felt nothing. Howard's life ended in much the same way he had lived it, without much fuss. Good evening, everyone. It's me. Dr. Plague, thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. I hope you enjoyed something a little different tonight. I don't often do third-person stories, but Howard's story was just a little too good not to share with you. Let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to Leslie Lou Riddle for being our Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributor, and thanks to Glenn Jenkins for being our Ghost Rider Tier Contributor. Thanks, guys. You're what breathes life into this show every week. If you too would like to support the show, come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you can join Leslie Lou Riddle and our Spooky Skeleton Army and have your name read out at the end of every episode and every TikTok that I do. $5 contributors can also suggest a Monday story, so come on down early and get your requests in. If you enjoy what we do here at the show, may I ask that you subscribe? I see that I get a lot of views, but um, not, not as many subscribers, and we're nearing that 1,000 mark. Maybe go ahead and smash that notification button, too. That way you don't miss a story every week because I update three times a week, and, you know, I wouldn't want you to miss out on some of these great stories. If you liked old Howard's story, it's in Dark Vortex, which is what we're still reading these days, so go get your own copy. You can read along with us every week. It'll be like our own little book club. I think you'd really enjoy it. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.